Good evening, and welcome to the third lecture of the 2020 UTU season. Tonight, we will hear from Doug Fabrizio and Kelsey Moore with Radio West and Radio West Films. I am Brooke Abel, coordinator of the UTU lecture series and will be moderating the lecture. If you have any questions for Doug or Kelsey, please email clubs at alumni.utah.edu or comment in the YouTube chat throughout their presentations. We will address your questions during the Q&A portion of the event. It is now my pleasure to introduce Doug and Kelsey. Doug Fabrizio is the host and executive producer of Radio West. He has been with KUER since 1987 and became news director in 1993. In 2001, he became host and executive producer of Radio West and is now sought after as a moderator and voice for civil discourse. He started Radio West Films in 2014, and since then, millions of viewers have enjoyed these short documentaries on platforms including Vimeo.com, People.com, and TheAtlantic.com. Doug has won numerous awards for his reporting, as well as for Radio West. Doug obtained his broadcast journalism degree from the University of Utah with minors in theater and Spanish. Kelsey Moore is a producer for Radio West Films. She studied musical theater at the Victorian College of the Arts in her hometown of Melbourne, Australia, prior to coming to Utah to study film. Before joining the team, she made short documentaries for NGOs telling their stories of impact, taking her to nearly every continent around the world many times over. Before we get, begin, please enjoy this short clip from Radio West Films. When we make They're like, when I look at you, you're so small and you look like the sweetest girl. But like, it's a different thing when I get into the room. <laughs> when we make a pack and it has a story with it, that's like producing the art from an artist, right? One guy made some comment that I must have the owners of this ranch spooled. You know, I must have talked my way into this position. I've definitely gotten little jabs like that quite a bit. I, I find I'm pretty weak anymore. It was doctor appointments, my surgery, plus the medical bills and everything else. So it, it does run into money, you know. You know, I owe it to her to, to understand what she was going through as much as I can and to find some meaning in her death. I think we Anyways, are you are you hearing me now? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody told me I was muted. Sorry. Thanks for having us um, very much, and welcome to all of you who are with us tonight. So, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do with Radio West Films was we wanted to. Um, I guess the question is first, probably. It probably seemed strange at first for a radio station to be making films when we started them, we called it Video West in those early days, we did get those kinds of questions. Like, you know, what is the point of you doing this? Shouldn't you be devoting all of your creative energy to the show? And we don't get those same kinds of questions now. I mean, a number of news organizations, as a lot of you probably know, podcasts and magazines, a lot of them make short films. The New Yorker, uh, New York Times, The Atlantic did for a while, Radio Lab did for a while. And we started doing this for a few reasons. Uh, one kind of personal selfish reason on my part, I really missed the process of field reporting. I liked going out and collecting tape and I liked shaping it into a story. And also I had done some documentaries at PBS Utah and I really enjoyed that experience immensely. I loved it actually. So I wanted to keep doing that. And also in the early days, we talked about this as you know, making films as a good exercise for our team to be collaborating on this different medium, working out these decisions together with your colleagues is, it's a lot of fun and it can really, I think, be good for our journalism, good for the show. And another reason is that it helped us be better storytellers and really be better at recognizing 
what is a story and how do you find stories? I wanted to bring Kelsey Moore in uh, to the conversation at this point. Kelsey, say hi to everyone and uh, maybe say something about why short films are important for you and why a public radio station should be doing them. Oh my gosh, give me a hard one. Um, so I'm Kelsey, um, I've been working for KUR for about three years. Um, and before I was uh, doing just a lot of short um, commercial documentaries. And so this opportunity of working for KUR has um, enabled me to focus really just on good storytelling without a client, you know, without any sort of object or motive, you know, it's just about finding good stories, good people. Um, and I mean, selfishly, I love making them because I love forming new relationships with people. Um, I mean, that's one of the best parts of this job is like every day is totally, totally different. Um, we're, you know, constantly doing really amazing stories with really amazing people. And I mean, as a viewer, I love viewing those. So making them too and being involved in the whole process is just really rewarding as a selfish thing. But um, I do value like the journalistic integrity that we, you know, maintain at KUER, being able to tell local stories, I feel like has become more and more important to me the longer I stay here. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping to fold in some of your questions that some of you sent before into the, uh, our presentation. Um, and then we'll have questions, of course, after as well. Linda Child asked this question. She said, what's your selection criteria? When it's your job to tell stories, you have to find them. And that's the hardest part. Um, you also have to be really attuned. This is kind of one secret. You have to be attuned to the world around you. Um, and this may be a, an instinct, I think, for all good journalists, but when you overhear the details of what might be an amazing story, you have to be ready for it. A really good example of that came a few years ago when I happened to be in the hallway of our building talking with Alice Weber, uh, development director at PBS Utah and KUER, and she was saying she had friends in town up at Alta skiing. And the weirdest thing is going on with, with her friend. She had this brain injury and it made her, the effects of this made her speak in an accent, in different foreign accents. And it's driving her family crazy. And I thought, wait, that's a story. That's an amazing story. Now, it just so happened that they were leaving like that day or the next day. So I immediately got in touch with Kelsey and said, can you get up to Alta? And can you, can we make this story? And so Kelsey had to rush up there. We didn't have a lot of time to do it, but what we uncovered was really a, just a remarkable a remarkable story. Kelsey, you want to say something about it? We called it Miss Me, I'm Irish. Yeah, I mean, I will say this is probably not one of, well, it's my mom's favorite one that <laughs> I've ever done, but yeah. I, it, it was filmed in two hours. I mean, we did, I, you, as soon as I walked into work, you're like, you have to go up there now. This is amazing. And, um, and so I got up there. I mean, it's about an hour and an hour and a half away. Um, and shot it within two hours, so I wasn't taking too much of their like literal vacation. They had just a couple of days here. Um, and uh, I mean, what's surprising about this story was you hear that that she's had a concussion and she um, now speaks in another accent and can't stop it. And it's funny, like you, it's like so bizarre that it's like, what on earth is that even real? How can that be real? Um, and then once I got there. Um, I guess I came with like sort of a sense of humor about it and then started the interview and she had her whole family sort of behind her and um, just very quickly in the interview realized that this was not a funny thing for them. And I, I just hadn't even comprehended how hard it was, was and would be for them. And so um, in this clip that we're gonna show, it's sort of the moment where probably how I asked the question was in a funny way or something. Um, I don't remember, but 
the answer just changed in an instant, in an instant. And the rest of the conversation, um, the interview like completely changed based on that, how it really felt, which was not a funny event. <laughs> yeah. Going to that, yeah. Okay. Bear with me for my own technical issues, sorry. Um, so within an hour, I'd gotten hit three times, um, which is not good. About uh, four months in, something weird started to happen. I started to get some complications. Um, <laughs> it gets, that's a hard part. And this just developed slowly over the course of um, a week. And the last day, it's gotten quite severe. I went to my cognitive therapy yesterday and they could not really answer my questions. I mean, it was, I think I thought it was amusing first too. And I'm like, oh, this is so funny. She's got this Irish accent. And by the way, she had an Italian accent for a while. She had a Swiss accent for a while. She's tried all kinds of different accents. Where they come from and how this really manifests itself is still really unclear. She, had, she at the time of the time we filmed it, she hadn't actually gotten an official diagnosis, but she probably had this rare condition called foreign accent syndrome but it's an injury and it was affecting the family in really dramatic ways. It wasn't funny to them. Um, and it turned out to be, as Kelsey said, a really, I think, powerful story and a powerful moment. And, and I, I think just being, again, going back to being willing to be nimble, Kelsey's ability to be able to say, yeah, I can go. And she did. And being attuned to, the fact that that's a story um, and that could be really interesting. That's one of the things that I think is almost more important than anything else is recognizing a story when it manifests itself because it, it, really, it really does and really will. One of the things that we wanted to do with Radio West Films was also create this community of local filmmakers. And I just loved, I have to say, I loved this idea of gathering around with filmmakers in the state or you know wherever and talking shop with people who are struggling with their projects and talking about story development and editing challenges and the effort of trying to get the money to pay for it. And we are very much still interested in that, but it's been really difficult, I have to say, to get local filmmakers together um, for various reasons. I mean, in some ways they all have day jobs. And so these passion projects that they have and all filmmakers have passion projects that go outside of the clients that they're working for. Um, they all have them, but they have to set them aside at times. And it reminds me of something that Kelsey just said, and it's kind of that great gift that has, it's been, that has been for us for KUER to allow us to employ Kelsey to develop a budget, to indulge us with these projects, many of which don't end up on the radio. Sometimes we don't really talk about them on the radio in some way. So what's the, what's the value of that? We think there's a clear value, of course, as we will we'll talk about and have talked about, but that's been a great gift to be able to spend time doing these short stories and these projects. I'll mention a few of the collaborations that, that we did do though. I mean, they haven't worked out like we hoped necessarily, but we did have some really terrific collaborations. And if, you're, if you have the time to browse through Radio West Films, you'll find some of these. We had a, um, a collaboration with a, a filmmaker by the name of Skylar Nielsen. He has a, a company called Vita Brevis Films. And it was a conversation with Nalini Nadkarni. Some of you may know who she is. She's this brilliant, uh, expert on trees. Uh, she's probably the world's great expert on trees and she happens to be at the University of Utah. And it just so happens that a few years ago she fell 50 feet out of a tree and thought she would die. And we've documented that, uh, that story and we're still interested actually in talking more with her, but that, that story was called Fallen Tree. Another story just on the, on the was a collaboration with um, 
a film company that was called Goodline at the time, The Goodline is, came from a conversation I had with my dentist in the dentist chair. And he was doing my teeth and telling me about this profound experience he had with his daughter who had, received, had to receive an emergency heart transplant. And it was one of those times where I'm like, that's a story. The thing that was interesting about it, um, and we'll talk about how you identify a story from just something else is, this was the twist, this was the surprise. He felt relief and joy for sure that there was a, a donor that could save his daughter's life. But what he didn't expect was this sense of guilt. And that was the twist that made me think this is a really fascinating story. Um, and that was a really great collaboration that we uh, spent a lot of time on. And it's, a, it's called Of One Heart. And then the final one I'll just mention because he just passed recently. Some of you may know Jeff Metcalf. He was a great, terrific writer and professor at the University of Utah. And not only it was he a terrific writer, but he was obsessed with fly fishing. And so we created a film that actually, Kelsey, this was, she was involved in this one as well. Um, one of the earliest um, really collaborations where we went and had Jeff tell us a story uh, on a river. And then it's, um, it's called Ghost Come Closer. So some of the, some of those are the collaborations that I wanted to mention. If you have a chance to look at those, I think they're really great. Kelsey, did you want to say anything about those? Yeah, I um, when when you guys hired me, I remember one, that was that's been one of our goals always is to have more collaborations and really center Radio West Films in the community, and that this feels like a community effort. And it's it's challenging because we're just a small market, but I mean Utah has such an amazing film community and um it's it's awesome when we do get to do them and so i'm looking forward to being able to do more because i i don't even think utah realizes how much we have to offer i mean really utah has an incredible incredible film community um and we are looking into initiatives now to work more on that and lifting up filmmakers of color in utah and we have some exciting things on the horizon but it's um it's it's a great thing that we love to do yeah so uh, Kelsey and I wanted to talk about the films that we've been making now over the last um, few years and what it has taught us about telling stories and how difficult that can be because when someone trusts you enough to share one of the most personal parts of their life, it leaves you as a filmmaker and as a storyteller and as a producer, um, it leaves you with this obligation, not just to get it right, but also to be honest. And sometimes in the effort of trying to be honest, there is a conflict that comes some, sometimes emerges and we'll talk a little bit about that because you have to make choices. Ultimately you're filtering elements of that story and you have to decide what goes and you have to decide what might stay and how the images or the sound bites that you choose might affect you know, the telling of that story or the way people are going to perceive the telling of it. There's a story that we found a few years ago uh, called Bonnie and Mark, a, story, a film that we produced. And it, at, first, it's a, at first, it was a love story. The way it was told to me. Hey, yeah, how did the story come to you, Doug? I don't even well, know who, how did it first so, come to you? So somebody called me and said, I've got this story. It's a remarkable story. This is playing out in Provo. And it was a woman, it was a man who taught philosophy at... Uh, <clears throat> forgive me, at Utah Valley University. And he um, had gotten a divorce and this other woman who was his teaching assistant at the time had also been in a transition period in their personal life and they fell in love. And the story was, uh, it, was a, it was a love story, them, them coming together, but it so happened that just a few months after they had been married, Mark, the philosopher, had a stroke, a very extreme stroke, which left him severely debilitated. And so when we went and started shooting that story, it was about the decision that Bonnie made to stay with him and be with him. And so we went down and we shot it. 
But I didn't think, we started to cut it. And as I was cutting the story, I'm like, I'm not sure this is a story. Like it's, it's, it's inspiring and it's, it's, it's lovely, but nothing is really happening. I mean, yes, the stroke is happening and we have some reflections back on that, but I wasn't sure if there was a story there. So we, we sat on it for a year. We didn't do anything with it. And then after that year, I got a phone call or an email, maybe it was from Bonnie. He said, I just wanted to let you know what's going on. And what was going on was she couldn't do it anymore. She could not be in that relationship anymore. It was just too much. It was too much of a burden for her. And now the story changed for me. I thought that was the story. The woman who had said, I'm going to be with this man through thick and thin, no matter what wasn't going to be anymore and it was a difficult story so we went back down and this is when Kelsey got on board in this part and we had to make some really difficult decisions Kelsey you want to take it from there we could talk a little bit about some of the conversations we had about how we were going to portray Bonnie and the decision that she made yeah I mean that's how I remember it this was one of the first projects I did with you guys and um like definitely walked into the sort of um is it an ethical dilemma i don't know if that's an ethical thing or a moral dilemma of how, yeah how you portray somebody and it's a fascinating I don't, it this particular experience and we've had many others like this has made me see how much you can manipulate a story in editing i um, mean definitely when you're filming you're you're bringing i'm bringing my own lens to the image when i film and the way i film at the angles i'm using but um in the editing room, I mean, that's where the magic happens and that's where a lot of damage can happen too if you don't do it right. And so I do remember when we were editing this, that being sort of, um, I think I did a first cut that was a bit more critical of Bonnie and um, and it wasn't intentional. I mean, I was just using the material that we had, but the feeling I remember all of us had after it was like, this is intense. And if we put this out there, she will receive um, criticism based on how we've cut this. And and I'm sure she has in her life anyway, because it was a really hard decision that they've and hard thing that they're experiencing. But we did another cut. Um, and I think we all you know, all it takes is just pulling out a couple of, you know, lines here and there, and all of a sudden you have a very, very different film. And um, I think that's usually where you and I, when we're editing, that's when you like oh, when you're putting something out into the world that is potentially going to change someone's life, you have to take that really, really seriously. And, um, and I think it's better maybe unless it's an expose or something, you know, but I mean, honestly, the more I film, the more I realize just how nuanced all humans are and it's better to be, to verge on the side of kindness or leniency and whatever, you know, however it looks in the film. And, um, and so that's what we did with the film. And I, I think it just makes it better because it really, I mean, I love personally seeing films where you can't figure out whether they're good or bad or like who you align with necessarily. And I, I, I do feel like you feel that in this film where um, you, you feel so strongly for this poor man that is um, living alone now in a home amongst a lot of old people but you also feel for this like young woman who wants to live her life and and celebrate you know being an active healthy person who also has obligations with children and her own life etc etc so um I that was a really enjoyable cut to do yeah that was yeah. a tough one because we went back and forth like no we should just be brutally honest with this but then you're making your own kind of judgments. But yeah, it was a tough one. And these kinds of decisions come up, I have to say, all the time in these stories. Yeah. Play a little bit of that, will you, Kels? Okay. For me, I'd like to go in maybe a couple times a week and visit with him. And that's enough for me. Are you divorced? Yeah. I don't resent it. 
she gave everything she could for two years. I guess I do feel like it's my turn to give. That was, uh, that scene with him in that cafeteria was one of the most gut-wrenching experiences that I've had just because, and, and it taught me a lesson that I, I think that that moment, that scene that I did, I ha that, that I'm still learning. And that is visual storytelling is different from audio storytelling. If you think about it, and if you've certain, if you watch the extent of the film, all, all of it, and you see that moment in that context, it is unbearable in some ways. And it made me realize that visual storytelling, you, an image can convey something that I would be worried about as a radio reporter trying to find the sound of. And this is something that Kelsey's really good at, is finding the visual that expresses the thing. Um, and it's, there's that great, you know, I'm sure you've heard the saying, show, don't tell. And that's, I think that's, that's a gift that Kelsey really does have and that I'm learning, I'm learning myself. Actually, to that point, last night I was filming with um, a family who have lost their son um, to police brutality. And um, uh, I was filming in those murals that are outside, in uh, the new murals that have popped up in Salt Lake. Um, and each, for those who don't know, there's, you know, a bunch of murals in Salt Lake. Each one is of a face of... Um, a young person or a person who has been um, killed by police. And um, so I was filming with a family at a vigil there last night, and this was the first time that they had kind of been out in public. Um, and I was filming with the brother of this, of one individual who was killed. And, um, and he commented to me that he just didn't have the word, he didn't know what to say. And he was a bit choked up. It was, a, it was um, an emotional moment. Um, and that he was worried, he was just worried for me for the film, he, you know, like that it had to be a verbal communication between us. Um, and he was like, I don't know what you're gonna get. I, I just I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to do this. And um, I said, I mean, nobody wants you to do anything. The good thing about film is that sometimes silence speaks more, you know, and that's a literal like words versus not words in the actual moment. But um, it's an, also an editing choice too, right? When you hold off on an interview, um, on, on someone talking in an interview or whatever, and just let visuals speak. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most interesting things that has happened really in the experience of, uh, of doing these films is how both Kelsey and I and, and, and some of the other producers have developed as storytellers kind of to this point. Because, you know, when we began, this is something Kelsey was mentioning today, you know, we had an idea and we had this form that we were following, but it wasn't long before that started to really change and evolve. And it wasn't long into the experience with Kelsey that we really tried our hand at verite filmmaking or in any way, a form of verite filmmaking. This is where you, you don't rely so much, or in some cases, not at all on narration or interviews but you just let the story play out mostly as it happens. And it takes a very special skill to get this right. And again, it requires paying attention to what's happening in front of you, especially as you're shooting it. And one of our first experiences that we had doing this was a film that we called Greek Gods in K-Town. Um, and it was a story that I had wanted to do for years. For years, I had wanted to do a film about a high school play because I was a theater kid and I knew that theater kids are awesome and watching them work and, 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 you know, learning their lines and trying to control their expectations and their dreams because they all have dreams or a lot of them had dreams. That's so inspiring and so beautiful really. And so dramatic. So we looked around and we found a woman by the name of Cami Falk. She's the theater teacher at Kearns high school. And she let us in on the process as they put the finishing touches on their school musical, which was one of the worst musicals ever written called Xanadu. Maybe you guys know it, um, but this got us- Are you kidding me? It's one of the best, Doug. Come one on. of the best, yes. And 
it got Kelsey really talk talk about this experience because Kelsey really developed these relationships with these uh, relationship with these really re remarkable and funny and dramatic kids. Yeah, I mean that was probably the first project I'd done um, where I was following someone over time or a bunch of people over time. I mean, often with our short docs and in the other commercial work that I do or whatever it is, you kind of show up on a day and you have maybe a weekend to really quickly form a relationship and make something beautiful. And there's a lot of that goes into that with trust and all that. But um, with this one, it was fun because, I mean, these are young kids who you can't fool. I mean, like they know what's up and you have to be very genuine with them. And, and I, I did feel an obligation to love them. And, and I, I mean, I did love them, but um, to just be present for them. And so um, this was fun because I did, I actually don't know how long I was filming for, I should check. I think it was about a 10 week period of rehearsal for them. And uh, they, they, I, you just can't help. I, I do find this a challenge actually in filmmaking, I will say to, to, to have someone let you into their home and to let you in onto their trauma or, or whatever, a thing that they're experiencing and to trust you enough to manipulate it however you want. I mean, I wouldn't use that word. I don't think I manipulate stories, but you, I, you, can, you have to trust someone to give that to them and to put it out into the world in public. That, that will change your life in some way or another, putting your story out into the public. And, um, and I, wow, I'm losing track. Oh, I was saying, I, I do find it a challenge to do that, to really invest so emotionally and be considerate of someone to, I mean, I love the people that I film almost always. I mean, always that you, you form a bond and a connection. And then we work at a journalistic institution. So you have to be very um, objective or have an objective approach in the way, you know, that's sort of the goal is to, to, to do that, I guess. <laughs> and it, I find it very challenging to do that sometimes because you have to remove yourself in such a way that you're seeing everything um, kind of in a third person or something um, from a bird's eye point of view. And you have to remove yourself while also being present and, and being connected. And um, it's a really interesting dichotomy, but, um, and so that's what I feel like I had to do in this film is yeah. you know, I spent 12 weeks with these beautiful kids. Um, one girl, her father passed during it. She had just gotten the role and um, it was right when I'd started filming actually that her father had just passed. And this was like her first lead role in a musical at school. And I remember how that felt like that's a big deal. And, um, and, and so you get close to someone, you're sensitive to them. And um, so I'm describing it as a challenge, but really it's one of the coolest parts of the job to, to connect with people all the time and then um, craft their story in a way that's true to them. Um, but oh, I guess you're asking me this question because I remember <laughs> when I was editing, we did talk a lot about, uh, you, you said to me, <laughs> um, Kelsey, you have to like stop being so, yeah, what did you say? You have to stop being you have to like remove yourself or something. You're like, you have to stop caring so much. That's what it was, you have to stop caring so much. Yeah, I think that's I exactly like, what you said, which seemed really brutal to you at the time, I think. I was, I was like, yeah. which I, I still think is maybe not the right way to put it, I will say. Yeah, it's not. It's <laughs> but not. Uh, <laughs> but I, understood, I understood what you meant. It sort of takes a lot of effort to uh, show something in, the, in an objective way or, or, you know, you just have to remove yourself in some way. Yeah, yeah. That was a good lesson we learned, I think. Um, during that story. So go see it if you get a chance. It's called uh, Greek Gods in K-Town. Um, I want to talk about something that happened back in 2018 where we learned of the story that some of you know about of Vicky Chavez, a woman who had uh, fled her native Honduras to seek uh, asylum in the United States. She ends up here. She, I mean, she had experienced domestic abuse. It was awful and violence and she just couldn't be there anymore. And when, by the time that we found her, she had exhausted all of her appeals. She was facing deportation. And so what she did, as you may have learned, is she sought sanctuary at a church. She asked a community of faith for, for sanctuary, uh, the, the Unitarian Church on, uh, on 13th East. 
and they took her in. And we were interested in that story for a number of different kinds of reasons. I was particularly fascinated in the idea of sanctuary, which is this ancient concept where, where someone who had sinned or someone who was um, uh, being looked after by the law would seek sanctuary in a church and they had to give it to them and they could be there. I mean, it doesn't exist anymore. It's been done away with a long time ago, but she still applied that idea. And that's how we came to the story. And we've done, Kelsey's done two remarkable films uh, showing Vicky Chavez and her, her children. And she's still stuck in the Unitarian Church on 13th East. Um, Kelsey, talk a little bit about, about Vicky. Yeah, that one we came across, um, I mean, the benefit of being plugged into a newsroom literally next door to my office is um, I saw and heard immediately when our newsroom was covering this when she first went into sanctuary. And um, to, to, to what you were talking about in the beginning about knowing what's a good story, I mean, this to me is a clear definition of something that you immediately see and you're like, this is a good story. And um, and then at the same time, my thought when I have a, when I think that is um, that there, there's a lot that goes into that because someone's experience uh, experiencing a traumatic event, and so you want to honor that. Um, you can't just call them up and be like, like in the Miss Me I'm Irish one, um, and be like, hey, can I come hang out with you guys for an afternoon? It's it takes a little bit more work, and in these short films, sometimes we don't have time for that, or um, it you can't always do that in the way that you want. But with her, um, she was not letting press in to hang out with her very at all or very much. And so um, I formed a relationship with mm -hmm. her. We were talking on Facebook and, um, and she let us in. And at the time, and we've now done two films with her. We've done an update with her because she, like you said, is still there. Um, I mean, I don't... Yeah, I mean, we're at this point, we're the only press, I guess you could call us. I don't feel like we're press, but we are, um, that she's letting in. And um, and it's, you know, like I was, like you were saying, like when you were saying, like you have to detach yourself a bit to, to the credit of filmmakers, also sometimes you have to go all in and detachment is not the way to go about it. And so in this one, Vicky and I are now, I mean, full disclosure, we're very good friends and um, I treasure her and we talk a lot. Um, I think in the editing room is where, you know, I have to um, present a story that's not me being with a friend or something. But um, so, so that first film we called Sanctuary and I love your input for this film was to go harken back to the history of sanctuary and what that means. And I love that part of the film. And, um, and then now as we continue filming with her, it's become a bit more verite, me just following her around in the church and with her children now watching them grow up. And so now we've done two films. The second film that we did with her is called Shelter in Place, which we released um, maybe um, April, I think, or May. Um, just as the coronavirus is... Yeah, it was, really it was we were playing on with the, the wording that was coming. I mean, I wouldn't have come up with that name pre-pandemic, but um, yeah. And so, um, yeah, this new film um, just, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think part of this film, the challenge was her life is involves just being in a church. And so, you know, I went in on day one, recognizing that probably not was going to a lot, that not a lot was going to be going on. And then you kind of do it for a couple of days and you're like, yeah, not a lot goes on. And um, this probably doesn't make a film look very good or it'll be a challenge. And um, it's not that it doesn't make it look good. I take that back. But, um, and so as we were strategizing on ways to make the film uh, work, <laughs> um, I found out that she, um, every week is involved in a call with um, a bunch of everyone is invited to it who is in sanctuary churches around the United States and um, it is only them it is organized by a nonprofit and um, and more relationship building took place and we got access to record a zoom call and these were happening pre-pandemic so I filmed I think one pre-pandemic and then the second one was during the pandemic and um 
And that's honestly like the greatest part of the film, to be honest, um, because, you know, we can ask things in an interview and it feels like you're asking something, some, someone something in an interview, you know, it just feels like it. you can tell when it's a talking head. And we did that and we got, and she's lovely and honest and just gives a lot. But um, in these calls, you have 10, you know, depending on the day, 20 people from sanctuary churches around the United States, immigrants who are experiencing the same thing, um, confiding in each other, talking about their cases, talking about, you know, how they feel, their isolation. Um, and, and that was a real honor, honestly, to be able to yeah. put those in. And, and it was the least creative work that I did, but it made the film. It's a, it was a good narrative deceit, a conceit, because it worked really well. Show, show a bit of that, will you? Yeah. yeah. Apoyo porque nosotros los hispanos lastimosamente somos como un animal para el gobierno, no les importa. Mm -hmm. Pues sí, así pasó conmigo con la alimentación para mis hijos. Digo yo, tanto yo aquí, ellos allá, mm, en la cuenta de la iglesia había como 37 dólares. Y yo, nos vamos a morir de hambre. De todos modos, no hay solución. Eh, hablé con el pastor y él, no sé cómo hizo, pero él sí recaudó un fondo y lo, lo agregó a la cuenta y dijo, no, María, no te preocupes, ahora sí hay alimento para tus hijos. Y ese es muy, muy grande para mí. De veras, el apoyo de las iglesias es, y las personas de la comunidad es muy grande. Pero pues hay que hacer la lucha mientras Dios nos ayude a estar aquí. Pues sí, ¿qué le vamos a hacer, no, Juanita? Mientras pues, sigamos esperando. Seguimos esperando. Ni modo. No hay que perder la fe. No, nunca. Always I have fun. The, the work that Kelsey did creating the sequence of, <clears throat> um, I have to say it was beautiful, but, um, but the difficulty was trying to convey what it would be like. And you guys, you can probably imagine this now because you've all been sheltered in place yourselves during this um, pandemic experience. But for a woman to be confined with her children to that church, she can't go anywhere. She doesn't dare. She worries, of course, that she, and she very much could be taken into custody. So, so people go out and get groceries for her. They go out and get everything for her. And so she and her young children have to make their lives in that space. And so the way Kelsey was able to convey the passage of time through shadows, through the course, the, just, the, just the sort of um, quotidian stuff that happens during the day, getting up and then brushing your teeth and then making lunch and then just being bored and sitting there going through your phone because you cannot go anywhere. A lot of us can relate to that experience now, but it was a good um, piece of filmmaking, a really good experience, I think, to be able to have told um, Vicky's story. Um, we're gonna go to questions here in a moment. Um, we'll talk about some of the uh, other questions that have, that have come up. But one thing that I, I noticed as I've gone back and seen some of the films that we've been producing over the last um, few years is how much I still like them. And how just watching them, I'd really forgotten how much work went into them, the decisions that we had made, the anguish we went through over so many details and so many moments. And I remember this, I remember being incredibly excited at those moments when we realized sometimes together while we were you know, editing or I was talking to Kelsey about the edits she was doing that when we realized like, this is gonna work um, because sometimes you don't always feel that way but there is something about a moment in a film where you're like, oh, thank heavens, this is absolutely gonna work. 
And I've said that same thing about radio pieces and interviews that I've produced over the years. You know, you put all of this effort into it and then you send it out over the airwaves or into the ionosphere or wherever radio waves and video pixels go. And what you hope is that people will see it and that they'll feel the same way you did when you first learned about it and when you first recognized it as a real story. So Kelsey and I just wanna say thank you very much for paying attention to us this evening and thank you for being here and we'd love to hear uh, with the time left, whatever questions you might have. Doug and Kelsey, thank you so much for sharing these incredibly moving and personal stories. Um, if you haven't done so already, please submit questions via the YouTube chat or send to clubs at alumni.utah.edu. Um, so to start off, uh, what's the best idea you've had for a program that didn't or couldn't get made? Oh, man. Would we want to give that away is the question. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Because um, <laughs> we didn't do it. There have been a lot of stories that um, we've wanted to tell. Some I probably can't talk about um, uh, that we couldn't make work or haven't found a way to make work yet. Um, and so the, we have a lot, uh, the answer is it's not a very good one because I can't be terribly specific about, uh, about it. Like um, sometimes someone won't want to talk. Um, I, I, one of the, one of the, um, the show that we're, we, the idea that we still talk about endlessly is I am really intrigued by the laborers who, who gather outside of a Home Depot in the dead of winter, in the dead heat of August, because they want to work. And people will come by and pick them up. And we know their circumstances aren't always, you know, their, their, their legal situation, whatever that might be, it might be dicey, but they're desperate for work. And we have, Kelsey and I have talked about this for years, a couple of years now. How do we tell that story? How do we go and do that story? And it's been really hard because, um, I mean, the language barrier is not, not the problem. It's, especially in the environment we're in now, people don't want to talk for obvious reasons. And we want to be able to tell that story in a deeply humane way. So I'll just mention that as one. That we're still trying to figure out. How, but nobody I, steal it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't your away. <laughs> keeping an eye on you. Yeah, don't because we really feel strongly about that. That one of those stories. Anyway, how has the rise of streaming affected our collective film experience, in your opinion? Gosh, I I don't know. I I feel conflicted about it. Like for example, last night we had like five hundred people, four hundred and fifty people who are part of our Through the Lens screening for the film Boy State. Because we do this documentary series, for some of you who don't know, um, called Through the Lens. It's a partnership with the Utah Film Center and we do these screenings. And the first one we did, now we have to do them online. <clears throat> and the first one we did, there weren't that many people that showed up. People are still trying to figure it out. But last night we packed the virtual space and it was really great. And, but, I like going to see movies with people. That's part of the experience that, you know, that, and so I do think it's different. It's not the same. I'm sorry, it's just not. So the experience of seeing a film is really difficult and different now. I don't like it. Um, but in terms of the filmmaking, some of the challenges, Kelsey, talk a little bit about, about White on Purpose because that was a film that offered some challenges we had to deal with. Um, you couldn't go out and shoot it in the same way. So that story developed in a different way. Yeah. Um, you mean in terms of like COVID restrictions? Yeah. I mean, just the way you, you know, you had to go and be isolated when you shot some of the stuff that you did. The, the actual interview that we, we, we did was had to, like that stuff you saw with Vicky had to come from a zoom call. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's the conversation of like streaming, because everything has gone online anyway. Streaming is also like Netflix is also, you know, it, everything's just online right now. Um, also not just because of the pandemic. And and so in terms of how the pandemic influences it, I mean, I'm like happy that 
people can connect together, you know, like our screening that we did last night through the lens, you know, we cannot go to a movie theater. So I am grateful that we can connect together online and see something collectively together, but nothing ever beats being in a big black room and seeing something all with a group of people. And so um, that to me is number one, if we're in a pandemic, um, streaming is great, fine. And then if we're not in a pandemic, still go to a movie theater. <laughs> Uh, if someone would like to pitch ideas for stories, is that something that's possible? And if so, how would they do that? Yes. Yes. Send me an email. Yeah. Um, our emails are on the, we have a Radio West email attached to our films website and on the Radio yeah. West website, our emails are everywhere. Yeah. Um, for sure. That, that goes, sorry, I was going to say that that goes with both collaborating, you know, as a filmmaker, pitching an idea that way and, and if you want to be involved with it, but also just, you know, you know, you have a friend and he, you just want to share this cool story. All of those are cool. Yeah, absolutely. Cause that's not, like I said before, that's the hardest part, finding the stories. I'll include both of your emails in our follow-up email. So people will have it uh, easily accessible for them if they have any stories in mind. Great. Um, do you have aspirations to do something longer than a short film format, possibly a feature length documentary? I think it's always on our minds. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's hard with KBX. We have deliverables. We're like a news organization. Everyone else around us has a daily deliverable, if not more than one daily deliverable. So uh, I think we'd have to justify it to some people. But I mean, I know Doug and I, we are involved in our personal lives and stuff like that. So in a, in a KBR format, for sure. We'll see there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I think that I have to say there are times when some of these stories that we've been telling, I thought, gosh, that could be it. That could be a lot longer. That could be a piece, you know? Right, we did think that about one film. What was yeah, that? What was that? Like, this was for sure a feature film. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's called, called Casualties. Yeah. Uh, which you can check out. Because I actually still think there's a, there's a longer story in there. It's a story I'll just mention briefly, just so you know. It's a story that we came across a few years ago. Um, uh, and it's the story of this um, army specialist, this woman named Alyssa Peterson. This was in September of 2003. She died by suicide in Iraq um, on assignment there. And she'd only been uh, deployed for like three months. It took her, um, it took time for her brother, Mitch, to get details about what had happened. And, he, and when we first interviewed Mitch, and this was a story that played out for a long time because we, um, Elaine Clark, who was the pr producer at the time, did um, uh, a lot of searching to find documents. She filed, she filed FOIA requests, stuff like that, because Mitch wanted to know what had happened to her. And um, so, but he was willing to talk about about looking into how she died and why she died and how he felt about that and. Um, he, uh, you, you saw a little element of that in that uh, in that trailer clip at the beginning. Um, he said he owed it to her to look into what was happening, and it's such a deep, it's a complicated family story. It's a complicated story about what actually happened, the investigation, um, all of those kinds of things. I think that there's a deeper story in there, and it's that is one that we did talk about as being something that might make a feature piece. And and to KBI's credit, they do always allow us to create I mean nobody dictates what we do at all I mean we could create something as long or as short as the story needs to be and this one though in a feature I mean like Doug was saying there's just so much involved that it was like at some point you either went that way and you did it or you super condensed it into a moment or you know as a much smaller story and I still believe that it probably deserves the longer version of it, but um, we did eventually, we were just sitting on it for so long yeah. that we were like, if we don't do something, we're doing discredit to all the work we've done with this family, with Mitch. Um, so we just got to do something. So we just went with the short version, but yeah. 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 So do you feel committed to telling stories in Utah for the West or are you open to featuring stories from all over the place? I know that story you just mentioned um, was overseas, but uh, did they have a connection to Utah and that's how you found out about it? Mitch, her brother lives in Logan. Okay. Um, so there was definitely a connection. She grew up, they grew up, Mitch, they grew up in Arizona in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and, um, but some of her family's um, in Utah now. Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, 
I don't, I mean, there's so many stories about this place that you don't need to look anywhere else. I'm o- we're open. I mean, we have the limitations of being want to, being able to want to shoot them here. So that's, that's just self-limiting. Um, but I also love the stories that happen in this place. So I do feel like Radio West films is about a place, you know, it's about this place. The West for sure, I mean, would be more than willing to do that, but there's so many stories that we're finding in Utah. We do want to get off the Wasatch Front. That's always a challenge of a lot of, you know, news organizations like KUER is like, there's so many stories in the Southern part of the state, in the Northern part of the state. I mean, Kelsey, we didn't get a chance to talk about a, just one of the best films, if not the best film that we, we've ever done, Kelsey's done, is the film, a film called The Gray Area. And all of that played out with this, frankly, this homeless family in Southern Utah. So yes, I'd be open to stories anywhere, really. I don't like to put so many boundaries on it, but there's so many great stories here that there's plenty of material if we can find it, I think. Um, so before we end, uh, do either of you have anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> no, I think that. I'll just say, uh, the only thing I want to add, I'll just say on behalf of Kelsey um, and, and KUER and Radio West Films, thank you very much for allowing us to talk about these stories and the, and the films that we've been making. Let me draw your attention to a few things we still have in the works right now. Um, a, uh, one in a series of films that we've been doing um, with uh, this remarkable woman named Herta Saunders. Um, it's a series that we did um, we started, uh, she got this diagnosis for dementia in 2010. Um, she was 61 years old at the time, a professor at the University of Utah. She was recognizing these symptoms and she had been writing about the experience and she gave us this gift of allowing us to come along to follow her on this journey with the disease. And so go into Radio West Films, take a moment and check out that we have a separate section for the series and you'll see a beautiful um, website layout for the series of films and you can watch that process. We just talked to them, um, Herda and her husband, Peter recently. And so we're preparing another in that series. It's been a lovely um, experience, I have to say, just getting to know them as Kelsey was saying before, you establish these relationships with people and it's been delightful. So um, go check that out, um, that series with Herda Saunders, which I think you'll, will be, Um, you'll be delighted with and sad and feel joyful all of the things that we've gone through. Well, thank you so much, Doug and Kelsey, for sharing your stories and films with us. Um, We're grateful to have you at the University of Utah. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. If you'd like to learn more about Radio West Films and watch them, please visit films.radiowest.org. We look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, September 9th with Gretchen Dietrich and Jorge Roja, of the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Ben.